Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, campaigners say that 600 people are serving life sentences for murder, even though they were involved only on the fringes of a killing. They were convicted under the principle of joint enterprise, under which a person can be guilty of murder if the jury agrees they foresaw that a person they were with might kill or inflict serious harm. But today, a rare joint session of the Supreme Court and the Privy Council has been hearing appeals in two cases that could change the law. Our Home Affairs correspondent, Darsh Nasani, has this. Today, in the highest court in the land, a hearing began which could have important consequences for the controversial doctrine of joint enterprise. Amin Joggi was convicted of murder in 2012 for the killing of a former policeman, but it was Joggi's friend, Mohamed Hersi, who actually wielded the knife. Joggi was convicted for egging him on. My lords, we submit that the net cast by joint enterprise is far too wide, that this court has no option but to sort the law out. It really is a dog's breakfast. Joint enterprise is a 300-year-old legal doctrine that's been used to bring Stephen Lawrence's killers to justice and to lock up gang members. Prosecutors say it's a vital tool in securing justice for victims. But campaigners argue it's another name for guilt by association because prosecutors can hold a group liable for the actions of one member. In 2007, a father of three from Warrington, Gary Newlove, was kicked to death outside his own home after confronting a gang of youths. Three teenagers were convicted, but the mother of one of them, Jordan Cunliffe, has always maintained he should never have been charged. Although he was present, Jordan is partially cited and says he wasn't involved in the violence. The Supreme Court hearing is expected to last for the rest of the week. Well, joining me now is Janet Cunliffe, whose son Jordan was referred to in Darshan's report there, and the QC Michael Mansfield, who's represented the Stephen Lawrence family. Janet Cunliffe first. So your son didn't land the fatal blow, but according to the judge, he was bragging and shouting afterwards. Um, there were a number of other, other young people who... who that was attributed to. Uh, my son denies that that was him and um, the evidence of uh, that came from the young lad that said he was bragging described him as a completely different person anyway so uh, there is that is quite questionable. But it was nevertheless an, an appalling crime and your son should take responsibility shouldn't he for the uh, company he kept at least. I think when you're 15 years old um, you know it's a little bit difficult to be worldly wild and, 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 and know the kind of company you keep. Um, he was out with friends, uh, boys and girls he'd gone to school with. Um, some of them he, you know he, he hadn't known all of his life but they, they were he at the time he, he was losing his vision and he needed to, to, to keep in contact with people that he'd known from school in order to feel a little bit more secure about himself uh, he certainly wasn't out with people um, they weren't a gang it wasn't about being gang members and going out causing trouble it was a really unfortunate incident and and there's no you know our family feel dreadful for what happened to the victim but it wasn't my son that that that, that caused any damage uh, or any argument or, or laid a blow on the victim. In a case like Jordan's, is there um, a logic to charging secondary participants with manslaughter or something like that? Well, potentially there is. I mean, I, I just want to draw a distinction between two very different situations so that, you know, people who are listening or watching might begin to understand. If you and I decide tonight we're going to kill you, uh, but only one of us is going to do it, you, but, and you go away and do it, I might be with you, I might not be with you. But there's a joint responsibility if we've agreed that you should do it, and maybe I've even provided you with the weapon. So I, don't, I think most people don't have a problem with that form of joint enterprise. So it's the premeditated version of That's that. the premeditated planned version. The difficulty comes, and what the court is being asked today to do is to clarify and circumscribe the conditions under which maybe uh, somebody uh, you've just described, your son and so on, is held responsible because the pre-planning is one category. The other category is a sudden eruption of violence among a group of people who are all together. I mean, the big case that everybody knows about what happened in Victoria. Victoria Station, there were 20 people. 
Now, the question there is, in relation to everyone who's present, they can't just be found guilty because they are there and associated with the group. You have to be able to show that each individual who was there held a common purpose and did something towards the common purpose. So, so, so in a sort of gang situation like that, mm -hmm. would you argue that the principle of joint enterprise could be useful for, to police? Um, I, I, I have a problem with, with, pe with, with people getting the life sentence. You, you get the life sentence, say there's five people and they all get found guilty, and all five play some kind of part in, in, in the death. Um, I'm, I'm not averse to the five people being punished, but the act to give them, all of them, the mandatory life sentence. So if, if there's a stabbing and one boy wields the knife and stabs and the others are not aware that he's going to use that knife, I don't agree that the other four should get a 24 so is it a problem? mandatory well, life yeah, sentence. The, the, it's you've problem just put your murder. finger on the problem. If, the other, if there are five and the other four don't know anything about a knife, then they're not going to be liable. Yeah. But they, there's, proving, that, there's proving that to, yes, a, to a jury and... Yeah, this is a, an evidential problem, mm -hmm. which is, is the difficulty. If the four don't know the fifth has got a knife and aren't participating in that sense, of course they're not responsible, they're not liable, and the, and the law doesn't hold them responsible. The problem in front of juries is that once you have a group of five, there is a risk that a jury may convict because you were there. And the idea of presence, mere presence, at the scene of a crime at which a number of part people are participating has always been a problem. And it is about time, I think, the Supreme Court actually begins to grapple with what is mere presence. I and think, also, sorry, I think, sorry, I think the other issue as well is, is, is the possible foresight and probable foresight. Um, you know, that, that's the issue that the Supreme Court are, are, are trying to deal with as well this week, that is it enough to say that someone had possible foresight that a crime may occur? Um, and obviously, when you say, you know, there's four people, one has a knife, uh, that's when the CPS will say that the other three could have had possible foresight that they did have a knife and that they would use that knife and that death or serious injury may occur. And it, it's all sort of about uh, possibilities and uh, it, it's not it's not they knew they it's had the knife. Hard to pin they down. knew they would use that knife. And I think I think that's the important thing that you you know you, if someone's going to go to court on a murder yeah. charge, you have to know that you know that the person had the knife, not possibly could have known. Okay. Janet Cunliffe and Michael Mansfield, thank you very much for joining okay. us.